Modern architecture is no longer bound by rules. This allows creativity and cutting-edge ideas to form daily. The technology of construction must therefore evolve. At Bluescope, we are at the forefront of innovation. We develop steel not only to serve as material, but also as a source of inspiration, helping to fuel the creativity of architects looking to build the latest modern architectural marvels. Bluescope's innovative lightweight steel has allowed architectural forms to become increasingly organic. Our flat, curved and tapered steel panels reveal a new world of possibilities for freeform architecture. Once freed from the limitations of traditional materials, buildings can now be crafted precisely according to aspired values and aesthetics. Every building has the potential to become one of the world's iconic designs. Innovations in coated steel have helped improve its utility and beauty in all types of designs, from buildings to home appliances. Bluescope's innovations have transformed steel into a primary material suitable for all types of design and construction projects. Even houses can now be included as our innovative structural steel can be used anywhere from the roof, walls to the floor and is durable in all weather conditions. Building houses has never been this easy, convenient or quick and standards have never been higher. Bluescope will never stop developing and innovating. We want to push boundaries and help transform a great design into an architectural masterpiece recognized around the world. With our networks in Australia, America and Asia. Bluescope has become a world leader in innovation and the production of coated steel and pre-painted steel. We are advancing the construction and design industries and improving the standard of living for people of all classes. We manufacture the highest quality cold rolled steel. Coated steel and pre-painted steel of beauty and unmatched durability. Bluescope has also set new safety standards in the construction industry. Our system processes and equipment during installation put the safety of workers first. Going beyond the limits of imagination will no longer be just a dream if we have innovations that can make it a reality. Bluescope will work with architects and designers to support and inspire each other with the goal of advancing the worlds of construction and architecture together.
Good afternoon, honorable guests and fellow architects. Good afternoon, Ajahn Hansa. Good afternoon, Ajahn Pacharin. This afternoon, we are honored to present Mr. Max Schwitella, the founder of Max Schwitella Studio, Studio Schwitella, which is found in 2012. Prior to Studio Schwitella, he has worked for OMA, Graph, and co-founder of Hen Studio B. His studio focuses on experimental work intersecting between architecture and urban design, conceiving of neighborhoods as three-dimensional structure in response to the future urban mobilities. The work of the studio Switzerland have been awarded with Clown Humphreys Prize, uh, um, the prize for the city and density, visions for the city of tomorrow, offline for visionary projects for transportation by rope, um, Evolo 06, competitions for a skyscraper, and Tate in Space for Tate Gallery London. Now, please welcome Max Switzerland. Good afternoon. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a Big pleasure, and it's a big honor to be here today with you. Um, is a presentation? Yes, fantastic, it's working. So, um, um, given the fact, or given this, the theme of this talk, uh, the idea of Ban Ban and the rec uh, reconsidering dwelling, uh, we try to frame our presentation uh, around this topic and basically say, think about dwelling uh, in the context of the future of urban mobility and the form of neighborhoods. So how will the future of mobility shape our cities differently than it does today? Um, as mentioned before, our work is much more experimental, more research driven. So please expect, uh, uh, don't expect too many finished projects yet. I will end with one that we start uh, constructing this summer. Uh, and you see on the bottom right, um, basically our, we don't have traditional clients, we rather have these kind of uh, research partners from the industry, um, which is, um, you know, mobility providers, basically. Schindler Elevators, uh, Audi, the car company, Mini, and other research institutions, uh, like the Fraunhofer Institute, who, uh, you know, do re collaborative research with us. So, um, but before we start, I would rather uh, introduce, uh, basically, the team uh, and the, the studio family, uh, basically the family, since 2012, not everybody right now, but you know, since we started in 2012, and actually only Oke and myself, we the Germans on this sheet here. Everybody else is from Mexico, uh, France, Spain, Ukraine, Lithuania, Austria, Daniel, and you know, but actually it's, most of them are, com are coming from Thailand. So you see Pa, Goop, Fuse, Jojo, they're sitting here, three of them. Um, and it's, it's quite interesting, so our uh, uh, studio is much more Thai than German, actually. <laughs> and, you know, I just came here, Berlin, seven degrees and rainy, so I, I really start thinking to re reallocate to, to Thailand, maybe. <laughs> I hope to come back early <laughs> again. Yes, um, so I actually, when I was younger, I was uh, a skateboarder. Um, of course, not uh, as good as this guy. I uh, would probably be dead by now and not sitting here. Um, but I think it's a really interesting way to read the city if you're a skateboarder. And you, you actually move through the city uh, in a different way. Uh, obstacles become kind of, you know, opportunities to do a trick. You read it three-dimensionally. And I think that's really uh, where I started to fall in love with, with architecture, with the urban uh, design, basically, around it. Um, and then this happened, 2000, I think 11 was that. It actually didn't happen to me, it happened to my ex-girlfriend, but don't worry, she's fine, everything is good. It was, uh, it was not a, a, a bad uh, crash, but it was, you know, it was, uh, the financially it was a disaster for the car, so it didn't make sense to fix it, basically. Um, and I think it was actually the best thing that could have happened to me. Um, I don't know, who, who of you owns a car? Like, could you raise your hand quickly for me? Okay, so it's the students in the back, right? So little of them. 
but but you know, think about if you own a car, it actually is it really freedom for yourself or is it actually limiting limiting yourself? And I realized when this happened to me, it's actually it was a big you know freedom for myself to get rid of that car and to say like, well, I, I stop owning a car, I actually can choose every day differently how I can ride through the city, and that was for me really you know really important moment actually. And it was at the time when um, you know there was a uh, car sharing popping up in in Berlin. Uh, car to go from from and then drive now all these brands uh, so there was a you know this time of a behavior innovation that we start instead of owning the car we share the car uh, and I think that's a really important you know time we're living in right now because this happens this behavior innovation the sharing par paradigm shift uh, and com combine that with a product innovation um, which is you know now the autonomous car has been all over talked about and I think it's an actually um, you know, a very important combination of those both. If we share um, kind of new technologies, you know, beautiful things will happen to our cities, I believe. Um, and actually cities um, start to realize we cannot dedicate our city design only to the car anymore. This is an example from Barcelona where they are researching the idea of a super block. So they actually want to um, cut off two out of three streets for cars and give them back to the pedestrians. And I think that's, you know, you know, city mayors realized we have to compete with each other for our citizens and we, we have to offer quality of life, not to the car, but to the people. And um, I think it's a you know, very interesting kind of approach. And of course, we as an architect and urban designers, we have to be aware of that whatever line we're drawing that is dedicated to the car has a direct impact to the urban environment. In Europe, almost 25% of the greenhouse gas emissions are coming from transportation. And of course, most of it from, from road transportation, from cars. So I think we have, to, as, as urban designers, we have to be aware that you know, functional se separation, uh, zoning, and you know, the, the, the thinking for the car is actually has a you know, huge impact to, an, uh, to our urban environment, to, to the environment. So, can we organize our flows, not just linear in a plane, but also start to you know, organize them maybe three-dimensionally? That's an example of a subway that could turn into something like this, which is called, we call a Babel town on purpose, because it's, it's not meant to be built like this, but we're saying like, you know, let's, it's a provocation um, of, uh, that we say, can we think city planning three-dimensionally? Not just two-dimension in a plan, but you know, really start, you know, densify our cities in a three-dimension. And I think really images, you know, are really important. Um, you will see a lot of images, uh, uh, collages, renderings, um, because you know they, they're for us architects such an important tool. Uh, because architecture, you know, takes so long and it's so expensive. I mean, so in between, you know, the images are so such a you know important tool for us and. Um, Looking back, you know, the 60s uh, and the 70s, I mean, these are really, you know, these times were for us really inspiring or like, you know, still are very important uh, references um, and, you know, architectural provocations from these times, you know, collages, images uh, to provoke new thinking. I think that's really what we, what we, uh, what our heroes are, basically. At the same time, maybe, can we turn off this a little bit more? So I think it's more important, this stuff here. Can we so bright so I don't see you as well? Anyway, so um, in the 60s, um, that graph shows basically um, how many people were living on the entire planet. 3.3 um, billion people. Today, we have over 7 billion people on the entire planet. That means in the last 50 years, the world population doubled. I mean, that's insane, right? If you think about like in the, in the, in the age of my parents, basically, during their lifetime, the population doubled. I think that's really crazy. And of course, we know today most of people live in cities, 50% roughly. That means the entire world population of 1960 today lives only in cities. And you know, these the question is, of course, we have to ask is like, how did we design these cities? And we're relying on technology that's even older than 50 years, 60 years. That's over 100 years old. The car hasn't 
you know, hasn't dramatically changed. It still has four wheels, it has a steering wheel, drives ga uh, on gas. And on the other uh, side, you see Alicia Otis, who presented the first elevator safety gear uh, almost 150 years ago, uh, and it's still working the same way today. The, the, the system, the, the security system mechanism is the same way uh, in its functional way today. So these ma mobility technologies shaped our cities, basically. Uh, and they you know, had these different outcomes, the car city, uh, you know, the horizontal sprawl, and then the verticalization um, the, the based on the elevator, basically. So that's the urban environment we're facing based on these you know, mobility technologies. That was amazing, I want to do it again. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> nice. But I mean, um, I mean that's amazing, but it's, it's actually terrible, right? I mean, that's, I mean, that's an uh, I mean, urban environment. It's, uh, I, don't, I don't know who, who likes to live in there, structured by highways, uh, streets, and roads for the car. And then, you know, that's the other extreme on the East Coast, uh, that's LA before, of course, and this is uh, New York, the East Coast, the, the kind of the icon of the elevator city, the verticalization. And of course, um, you know, this verticalization is not just happening in the US, it was an export model all over the world. 2016, there was, um, you know, around over 100 uh, buildings um, being constructed that are above 200 meters. So this verticalization is like, you know, it's a phenomenon around the world. And, uh, you see this kind of hitchhawk condition, uh, like the world turns into this hitchhawk and this kind of social uh, kind of um, dead ends, basically. Because, I mean, of course, density saves energy, right? Um, um, this is a graph that shows the consumption uh, of energy of a, of a four-person family that is living in a single-family house and that needs a car um, to commute. Uh, versus on the right, uh, the same family living in an urban apartment um, and using uh, public transportation and bicycles. And of course, we, we, this uh, graph uh, shows dramatically how, how much energy we can actually save. So again, uh, architects could, could, could actually contribute to save more energy instead of wasting it by cars. Um, but of course, it's also, you know, if we talk about sustainability, we cannot only think about energy. We also have to think about the social and economic uh, sustainability. And this graph shows uh, the development, the verticalization over time uh, in Hong Kong. Um, and we see you know, the ratio between privatized vertical space and the public layer uh, on the bottom, basically, is 1 to 12. So we, 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 we add more and more privatized space, we add more and more people, and we don't add public space. So we actually, we, there's a misrelationship between public space and private space, and people don't have space, literally they don't have space to meet anymore. Um, so now, you know, it's, it's, uh, the, the, the city space is taken up um, by these towers, and in between we have some roads left, basically, but there's no more space to actually meet. Um, so this is a living condition in, in, in Hong Kong, 15 square meter per person. Um, uh, in Germany, it's about 40 uh, uh, right now. So, but you know that's super extreme, and so life has to happen uh, within very kind of you know condensed uh, boundaries, basically. And then, of course, you know the, the architectural design behind it doesn't doesn't you know it, it takes it to extreme. So you know even even the hallway is like reduced to the minimum. So there's no more no more. Uh, you don't have a possibility to meet anyone around you anymore. Like you're stuck in your cell, basically. Um, and that's Hong Kong, uh, the hinterland, basically. Oh, it's, uh, it's kind of, you know, copy paste, uh, anonym anonymity, basically. This anonymous environment. You just you're just a number in you know street X, Y, and then you know level Z, basically. And that's also, that's Kowloon Bay on the left. Um, and on the right, I don't know if you recognize this, um, uh, from the movie Matrix, there was this human farm. Um, for me, it's not, it's not a science fiction, it's a documentary. 
it's, it's reality. I mean, it's happening. 15 square meters per person, everybody on a smartphone. I mean, that's, you know, matrix is, is for me, it's there, spatially, like, you know, uh, re represented, basically. And then, I think the, the worst is when, when both come together, actually. When the car city and the core city, you know, are combined, and, like, I've, I've worked, I, I had the chance to work a lot in China as well, and, you know, to see how they, you know, plan cities right now, it's like, you know, the, the urban designer draws the line for the car, and then the architect wraps the elevator. Sometimes nice, sometimes maybe not so nice, but, you know, nobody thinks about people. I mean, there's no person in this image. That's a city, but, you know, you see on the very left, there's maybe, you know, <laughs> almost being run over by cars. So, cities are built for cars and elevators, not for people. That's basically the message. And we want to kind of, you know, try to, to, to reset the focus on people and not on these, you know, old mobility technologies, basically. So that's an image that we, you know, photoshopped, I think, for, I mean, it's a very low resolution, but you can zoom in, like, you know, hi, we're all in there, like the team, we photoshopped for two, two months almost. Uh, <laughs> but I think it's really, like, it shows what we want to achieve, basically. Mm. And I mean, uh, this is stuck, okay. But uh, also an example from Hong Kong, we really have to, I think, you know, trust people more, like, you know, believe in people. They can do beautiful things and they can, they can overcome, you know, a couple of stairs. That's fine, you know, like we have to just, you know, I think walking is healthy and this is something we have to foster more. Mm. So what I'm going to show you now is like basically, you know, in the first chapter, a couple of studies, you know, that are, you know, designed, like neighborhoods designed that are, you know, driven by different mobility technologies, from walking to e-bike, to a concept we developed together with Audi, um, the flywheel. And then, you know, how this translates in the second chapter into urban kind of environments. And the third, I would like to kind of show you the first project that we're implementing now that has, of course, a, it's a much smaller scale, but it has these ideas kind of, uh, kind of embedded, basically. So the first, of course, I mean, this is the best, uh, the smallest mobility unit we can think of. Uh, uh, feet, uh, they're really, uh, you know, uh, they can do fantastic things. Walking is not, uh, doesn't equal walking. That's the most extreme examples. Walking through New York City versus walking through Venice in Italy. The most uh, extreme you could think of, basically. And, you know, the experience when you walk through cities is like either very uh, monotonous spatial experience in streets. You know, it runs linear through, like, you know, design around the car, so there's no, not much change happening. And the other extreme would be in Venice, um, where it's like almost kind of you get lost, you know, there's an easy to lose orientation in this kind of small spaces, kind of hidden corners and so on. Mm. And then we ask ourselves, could we actually, you know, in, instead of the one or the other, could we say, we, could the intensity of pedestrian flows become a design tool for a gradual field, field from narrow, private to open public spaces that gives actually a natural orientation? And, you know, based, I presented, I referred before to, to Barcelona uh, as a role model, as an idea for, you know, a test bed to put this neighborhood in here to say, you know, instead of linear streets, this kind of field condition, this kind of, you know, um, kind of gradient from open public to private closed spaces mm, that this image should represent. And, you know, walking through Bangkok, of course, you know, this is really... Now, so such an inspiring moment when you like these these boundaries blur between public and private moments. Um, um, you know, is is this a, you know still a shop? Is this still a street? Or is this already kind of a, an extension of a uh, of a of a uh, yeah, living room maybe even? Um, so this, I think, these environments are really possible if you start to if you if we only say we th we think of uh, walking, not not uh, of streets for cars. But then, you know, these, these private spaces, they could, you know, could fold into uh, these streets. They could block even streets temporarily um, because we can actually walk just around the corner, basically take a different path. Um, uh, so this architecture, the buildings, the, the units, they really become, you know, tools to kind of, you know, communicate with the neighbor uh, to generate different spatial conditions temporarily as well. And of course, these neighborhoods should always be interconnected, you know, so we, we don't want to limit people to only their neighborhood, of course, you have to, you know, move a bit further than that, 
uh, with bus, with metro conditions. Um, but, you know, of course, never cars. <laughs> and, I mean, if we, if we think these environments, we could even, you know, be very keen and say, like, well, why not include swimming into our mobility concepts? In, I mean, you might, you, you might be like, I mean, what the hell, how would you swim? In Bern, in the capital of Switzerland, people swim to work. It's possible. People do it. Why, why not? I mean, if we, uh, if we, if we think of salt water, uh, we don't have to clean it every time. So, you know, the, in the River Aare in, in Bern, if you, if you locate it right uh, from, from with the stream, uh, people actually jump into the river. You know, they have these bags, these red bags, where you put your mobile phone and everything in, and then they get off and then, you know, go to work. That's amazing, right? Um, so, <laughs> next one. Um, next neighborhood design, basically, designed around the idea of the e-bike. Mm. There's, you know, these, all these fun mobility concepts uh, coming up now, uh, segways, uh, these monowheels, they're <laughs> really uh, dangerous, actually. I tried one. It's really tough, even though I was skateboarding, but it's really tough to ride. But I think the e-bike, and that shows on the right, um, especially here as an e-mountain bike, is really interesting because it makes you faster, on the, but, it, but it also helps you to overcome height much easier. So, uh, so we actually thought that this is really, you know, it's a re it's a, you know, it's a very relevant alternative that is being thought of at the moment. The e-bike. There's a lot of Pedelec highways being planned in London and so on. So, how could we, you know, design space around this kind of e-bike concept? And so we, we, that's kind of a design language parameters, how, how kind of angles you can turn, uh, how high you can go with a, with a ramp and so on. And some artists already like, you know, uh, kind of uh, translated, no, that's not an e-bike, he has to do all the muscle work, but I mean, it's a really kind of interesting kind of, uh, um, kind of translation of, a, of movement into a spatial uh, condition uh, that we were really fascinated about. And then of course you can really like, Mathematically, I mean, don't ask me, please. The guys did it. I have no idea, but it's like really there's like high, you know, science behind, of course, that, and we kind of translated that into kind of you know rhino grasshopper tools and so on. So it became really kind of a kind of uh, kind of a, uh, advanced computa computational design tool, and then it generates kind of these uh, uh, spaces designed around the logic of flow, basically, and. The simple eight uh, was really fascinating for us to, to look further into and to say, um, yeah, design around 30 kilometers per hour, which is possible with the e-bike again. And then on the plates, on the kind of, on the slabs, you of course slow down basically. But what this eight uh, kind of actually does, and that's quite interesting, it, it ends up with these split levels condition. Um, and if you compare that to a traditional let's say, elevator core uh, building on the left, you find that you know, the, all the public circulation space right is adjacent to the private unit, basically, on the same level. With this split level concept, you actually end up with kind of this public space in between, and you have this, I should actually stand up and maybe and show, um, these kind of semi-private moments uh, in the units that are then connected with stairs uh, into the private concept on the top. And um, where else then, of course, Copenhagen could this be thought of? So let's say Copenhagen on, on LSD, you know, like yeah, the, the, uh, there's, an, there's a uh, recent advertisement that came out. The guys are riding already on, on, on the roofs of Copenhagen. Um, and so this could be a translation of that. So again, like, the scale is more a neighborhood. It's not a building itself. It's bigger than that. So let's say 200 by 130 meter. We kind of found a site that we could experiment further with. Um, and the slabs, these mega floors, are like then double height, eight meter high. Um, and so we don't have a grid of, of streets anymore. We have these kind of circular arrangements, circle packing uh, based on the eight idea. And then we have this kind of flows that leads you up and do down uh, from the, through the structure, basically. And this is like, you know, like a water kind of erodes through stone. It's basically this kind of these flows of people wash out the structure internally, basically. 
And this is how it could look like. And then you have these kind of semi-public functions inside, this kind of uh, uh, maybe a cafe on the you know, fourth floor and so on. Um, and see again, like this idea of a you know, double height floor and the, 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 the more semi kind of public uh, or private spaces on the ground floor of each duplex condition and then have this private function on the top. And this would be kind of a view from the top. And yeah, it's like, uh, it's like organizing flows, not just two dimensionally, but really think of them three dimensionally. Um, and this is, they should all be e-bikes actually. Um, I mean, they get really, not, they get, they don't look like e-bikes anymore nowadays. You can hardly recognize an e-bike. Like the motor is like part of the framing and stuff. It's really, I think an interesting kind of concept we should take further. Mm. This is a project we developed together with Schindler. Well, uh, most of the stuff is actually in, 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 in collaboration with Schindler. And this one is uh, a concept we did with Schindler and Audi together. So an elevator company and a car company sitting together on, on one table. That was 